and there's gonna be litigation and then it's a problem. So part of our job is to locate cars that are, aren't typically in a local showroom or dealership. And uh, we had gotten a phone call of a vehicle that was located in uh, East Africa. But our client kind of had a general idea of what it could possibly be. It is a 1939 Alfa Romeo 6C 2500 Corsa Special. And it was uh, a competition, a lightweight short chassis competition car that Alfa Romeo had built um, in the, the late 30s. I want to believe it's maybe one of six still in existence. At that time, it was their hill climb king. It was still trying to put Alfa Romeo on the map, mid 30s to late 30s. The racing industry, the game itself was, was up for grabs. It could have been anyone and everyone at that time. You know, with the war going off and companies going down and factories being blown up and, and some manufacturers completely stopping production to shift all of their efforts on metal production to army and the tank surplus and building ships. Manufacturers just couldn't build a car. This Alfa Romeo was extremely special. It's an inline six cylinder, twin cam, a 2.5 liter, and it had three Weber-like carburetors on it. The carburetors alone are valued at about $10,000 a pop, if you can find them. Connecting the dots on things, um, Alfa Romeo, again, had lost most of everything in the war. They had to basically pick up bits and pieces of what they had when they moved to South Africa in a small area called Eritrea. And they did a lot of vintage racing at that time. Um, hill climbs, um, basically most of Europe's racing heritage was in Africa. We'd got these vehicles sent out to us we're doing the restoration we're going through the process and we're getting it ready for for show you know what all right you know it's it's a pre-war alfa romeo you know the body might not be original it could be a, a remanufactured body as most of them were it could be a remanufactured engine but when it comes to really hard to find automobiles if you have a few bits and pieces you'll have someone or enthusiast sign off on it you know like you're good the crowd accepts it, and um, you get to go to the awards, win the shows, the events, the rallies, the races. So we're here with this little Alfa Romeo, and we're going to the shows, getting some awards. The restoration process took right about um, 1,000 to 2,000 hours. So the customer had already invested a heavy chunk of change into the vehicle, knew exactly what he was going to do with it, goes to the local shows, the venues, we go to Amelia Island, we get first in class, we get best race car award, everyone's happy, we're progressing with the car, he's bringing it to the Colorado Grand, the Copper State 1000, he's starting to do 1000 mile races now, and this little pre-war alpha is, is out there essentially kicking ass. It ends up sitting in a client of mine's garage for probably the better part of a year. My customer at that time says, you know what, I had some fun with it. Chances are the numbers on the engine probably don't match. It's probably a whatever motor that they had in the hills of East Africa and they threw it in there to run a few more laps around some dirt track. And or the body was remanufactured. I mean, when we were restoring the car, it seemed to be in, in decent original condition. It needed a lot of rectification, but most of them do. And he says, I'm deciding to sell it. So I said, no problem. I've got a... Uh, I've got someone in mind, a good customer of mine. He was just starting to get into the pre-war stuff. But when you get into the pre-war game, you have to understand that there could be many skeletons in a car's closet. So you kind of accept it as it is, just as the owner before. And he buys the car. The car's still sitting in the prior owner's house in the garage. He invites us all over one day to, um, to have lunch with the new buyer of the car, my client, both of my clients. So, you know, we're having a, a just a regular whatever, good time, good lunch in Bedford Hills, New York. Everyone's well off. No one's got anything to complain about. So who really gives a shit about some remanufactured engine or some mismatched chassis, but we got both the owners there under one roof. They're cool, they hit it off. They have a couple drinks and they start talking about the provenance of the car, the previous owner. You know, the first guy that was in the car said, hey, listen, yeah, what's a pre-war car? You know what you're getting into. The guy says, yeah, 
you know, the new owner kind of accepts it. He's cool. He's happy with it. But I just want to go check out a few things. They had a few drinks. So I'm expecting, oh, this could, this could get ugly. You know, they just traded about a million bucks, a million and a half dollars for the car. If one guy doesn't like something about it, you know, there's going to be a problem. There's going to be litigation and then it's a problem. They go out to the garage and, and at that time, my customer had sold it for a decent deal. He sold it as, you know, the engine could be whatever. They go out to the garage and, and Herb, the new buyer, turns and looks at me and he goes, Colton, yeah, what's, what's the deal with the, uh, the body? And I, again, I'm like, hey, listen, need, body needed a lot of work. We went out, kicked some ass out of Amelia Island. It was great. Did a little Pebble Beach action. We did great. Well, what's the deal with the engine? I'm like, eh, the engine, it's period correct, as most of them works. Probably replaced by Alfa Romeo, who knows? He goes, you got a knife on you or something? I'm like, why? He's like, there's some, there's some paint over here. And I said, yeah, that's, that's covering where the VIN numbers would have been. You know, he pointed right to an area on the block. And, and at that point, my, you know, my heart's starting to sink. I'm like, oh God, he's gonna take this number thing personal and it's gonna be problem. So I said, Herb, you know, you, you, you're really, you're taking a chance. He's like, yeah, but I already understand. What do I got to lose? You know, I already bought the car. They're two well-known car collectors at that time. And uh, it could potentially be watching two Rams on Discovery Channel when they mount up and they f***ing slam right in the middle of this guy's garage. So I said, all right, Herb, step aside, man. I'll, I'll f***ing scratch the paint off where the engine numbers are. And you're going to see that this is probably not going to match that. And uh, we're all going to walk out of here happy campers. I'm f***ing scratching the number away. And Herb's there. He's on the other side of the car. He's looking at the chassis number. And I'm scratching the numbers off. And I'm like, we got a one. And he's like, yep, we got a one over here. Scratch it off. We got a three. Herb on the other side in front of the ch chassis. He's like, yeah, we got, a, we got a three over here. What are the damn chances? We got a nine. And Herb's like, we got a nine over here too. Hitting it, now there's, there's typically five digits in this sequence. The chance of hitting all five, like hitting the lottery. You know, the guy just paid a million dollars for the car, a million and a half for the car. And I'm halfway through these digits and everything seems like it's matching up. But chances of having a matching engine with a matching chassis, again, is like one in a million. I'm going through number four and I'm like, it's an eight. Herb's like, I got a eight over here. Like, you got to me. Now I look over in the other corner, and I see the guy that sold the car. And the look on his face is like, you mother If this is a matching number, I'm going to lose my Now I'm like, yo, we still got a problem. This guy scratched the numbers. Everything matches. He's going to be pissed. This dude's going to be f***ing living life. Scratch the last number, and sure as it is the matching number. The motor matched the chassis. His car was instantly worth probably about three and a half, four million dollars over lunch bam just like that the guy that sold the car was obviously like damn had i known that was in there but it's like you know these things you don't we didn't typically look for them because it was in the mid to late 2000s numbers matching you know that sort of thing pre-war race car was just non-existent no one really cared you had nine tenths of the equation so it was you know it was like yeah it was guaranteed you got the car there it is you got the title you got the Fan number, you're good. He made about two and a half billion dollars over lunch. I love the way the Avalon King ceramic coating worked on my Porsche 993, so I was excited to try it out on my LP640. We put a clear bra on the car, but then on top of that, we put the ceramic coating to make it easier to clean. And after a 2,000 mile road trip, all the bugs just sprayed right off. It works great on my car, and you should try it on yours. So there's a link in the description below for a discount.